welcome uh, to our first, your first breakout session of today. Uh, so today we're going to focus on recruiting and the actual process. Uh, so what I want to do is sort of take you through, we'll kind of start at the beginning of like application, all the way to the follow up. Uh, for all of these sessions, we will save time for Q&A at the end, so about at least 15 minutes so you guys can ask questions. So definitely start thinking of good questions and, and we'll do those at the end as well. Um, and so we uh, will have a really great perspective here because we have John, who is obviously really high up at IFC and AMC and plays a part in the hiring. And then we have Antoinette and Kristen, who are both actual recruiters. Uh, so they have insight into that side of things. So um, so we'll just kick it off with um, maybe you guys can each share um, a little bit on, um, like a little bit just quick what you do um, on a day to day. Uh, and also either your uh, worst kind of hiring awkward story or like your favorite most best experience ever like pick like one side of uh, of uh, yeah the process like really bad or really good like mm -hmm. a specific as specific and nitty-gritty as you can get mm -hmm. okay <laughs> good or bad so you, you, John, you want to kick things off? I'm a gentleman I laid ladies first <laughs> <laughs> true gentleman oh gosh um, so my name is Kristen Rock. I've been recruiting for almost 20 years. I started in higher education and uh, for school of visual arts. So I used to do um, admission recruiting, which was a lot of fun. And I actually have been in touch still with a lot of kids that I recruited into college um, that are now professionals, which is kind of interesting and makes me feel very old. <laughs> um, and did technology recruiting for many, many years. And I think that a lot of us that were doing technology back then thought we were major rock stars because everybody was making a tremendous amount of money because anybody could make money. You're like, oh, here's a resume, then somebody actually knows how to use a computer. And they're like, wow, oh, bam, you could, you know, hire that person and somehow it all worked. And then fortunately, 9-11 um, happened and it changed a lot of the industry and it, you know, sort of forced me to do uh, and think about what I wanted to do and um, ultimately it pushed me into the creative field which is what my background is I went to art school um, I've been in house recruiter for six years which is what I really enjoy I like being part of a team I like being part of an organization having a vision having a goal um, and I work at um, engine which is a holding company that has many different companies underneath them uh, right now I'm I have uh, somebody who's helping me as a freelancer, but I'm the sole recruiter for several companies. Deep Focus, um, which is a digital advertising agency. Uh, Synergy Sponsorship, which is a sports marketing company. Uh, I help with ORC, which is a business intelligence and research company. Uh, I, we do some work with Trailer Park and a couple of other organizations under the in engine umbrella. So if you have any questions or interest in that area, just let me know. Um, I have many horror stories, <laughs> a lot of horror stories. Um, I one time recruited a missing person, which sounds really crazy. Um, he knew he was a missing person, and I guess wanted to stay missing, but needed to make money. <laughs> and it was very, very strange, and wound up helping people find him, which was really kind of interesting. Um, and But one of my best stories had to do with my own finding of someone. It was I worked at RGA, which is a digital advertising agency here in New York, and they needed a head of e-commerce. And I basically found someone who was really intricate to the beginning of one eight hundred flowers and doing my own research and finding him uh, and our relationship back and forth, he became that person. So it wasn't necessarily someone applying into it, but was my own sort of uh, initiative and uh, ambition and dedication to find this person for this organization. And he, when I left RGA, he told me I changed his life. So uh, I thought it was really cool that, you know, here was someone who I thought was like a rock star. I made a difference in his life. So anyway, great. Yeah. Well, I'm Antoinette Miller. Um, I'm a recruiter at HBO and I've been with HBO for three years. Um, I came into the organization recruiting for experienced hires. So um, starting with entry level talent then kind of building up to um, recruiting for manager level, director level um, candidates. And then I got kind of that two year millennial itch <laughs> of like, what's going on here? Um, how do I kind of expand on my skills and, and um, kind of just get some stretch uh, work and, and challenge myself a little bit more? I had just finished my master's and 
um, college recruiting uh, really intrigued me. So um, really kind of built out what that would look like in um, uh, kind of adding myself to the college recruiting team. And um, my VPs and leadership, they bought it and they said, of course, Antoinette, like that makes so much sense and we're you know, so supportive of retaining you and, and grooming you and developing you. Um, so I've been on the college recruiting team now for about four months, um, which has been exciting. Um, an interesting turn of events also because uh, when I transitioned over, my manager actually resigned. So I have now absorbed the entire college recruiting <laughs> vertical. Um, and so I am managing our internship program and all of our collegiate recruiting initiatives. Um, and uh, it's been it's been a great run. You know, we are uh, currently working on recruiting our uh, summer interns, which will be a class of 50 students. Um, and we're pretty much done with um, all of that recruiting, except for those technology roles that um, tend to be a little bit more challenging, especially for a technology, media, content, distribution company. It's kind of a hodgepodge right now um, in today's time. Um, and an interesting uh, hire, and it's a little, it might be a little cheesy, but um, I, Emily uh, invited me to um, the Find, uh, what is it? Find, Find and Follow, follow Your Passion, passion yeah. uh, conference, and I was a panelist like I am today, and I, um, you know, was at the Opportunity Mixer and was meeting a lot of students and uh, candidates, and um, I had a, a role open for a coordinator uh, temp job, and um, you know, like how how it happens after every recruiting event, we go back to our office, we have all these this huge stack of resumes, and we kind of go through. Um, and I had already had a candidate in mind for. Um, the role that I was recruiting for, but um, things didn't work out with him. So uh, naturally, I'm like, okay, let me go through my Find Spark stack. There must be somebody I can uh, reach out to and, and connect with. And um, I ended up calling in um, a young lady that I met at the conference, an opportunity mixer. Um, and she is now a coordinator in enterprises, and it really worked out. So she started out as a temp. Uh, we recruited her, and she's been so successful. Um, she's like our Fine Spark ambassador. So anytime we have a Fine Spark event um, at HBO or um, we attend a Fine Spark event, she's usually the person that I reach out to to say, "Do you want to come?" And um, it, it, that was very successful. And I think that's kind of uh, nourished the relationship that we have with Fine Spark. And I was able to go back to my leadership and say, "You know, there's value in partnering with this organization because we we're able to make a successful hire." Um, so it's nice. To <laughs> uh, I'm John Sinclair, I'm a creative director at IFC. Uh, our group's responsible for all of the creative and video content uh, for the channel, whether it's on air or digital, social, um, print, uh, sponsored. So really our group does anything that's video based. Mm -hmm. um, our team is a pretty large group. It's a big mix of writers, producers, editors, production assistants. Um, operations folks who keep things running um, and uh, it's uh, it's really a steady stream of freelancers coming in and working with us project by project and uh, and then moving on to the other things that they're working on in their lives and then we also have a core group of staff uh, creatives that work on our team as well um, favorite either great the, great, great hire or story. a horror story uh, one that's just sort of weird to just show the randomness of how you could possibly like have an opportunity is uh, when I was at MTV, I was sitting in my office one day and they're like, the new phone list here. Obviously, if you watched, the, if you were listening to the keynote, I'm obsessed with phone lists. I steal them <laughs> from jobs and stuff. But, so I got my phone list and I was looking through it and above my name was this guy, Joe. And he had a very unique last name. And I thought, this can't be the guy that sat next to me in homeroom 15 years ago. So I... He had a phone number, I called it, and it was a Santa Monica number, so I called out there, and he picked up, and I said, are you Joe from, like, Philadelphia, and did you sit next to me in homeroom? And he said, yeah. <laughs> Why are you calling me? <laughs> it had been, like, 15 years or so, and um, he, he said, I'm actually a freelance writer, I do comedy writing, and I'm working on some branded content for, it was like for Teen Wolf or Teen Mom or one of the teens something. <laughs> uh, and so he was working with, with them 
And I, I went down to his supervisor, who for some reason was on the East Coast, and started talking to her, and I told her the story, how crazy it was. And, um, and then, you know, after a few months, he moved on to the next thing. And so here I am now at IFC doing comedy stuff, and I, I because I still have the phone list because I took it with me, <laughs> um, I reached out to him, and I said, if you're still doing comedy writing, like, I'm looking, I'm always looking for a pool of, you know, writers and stuff. So it sort of worked out that way. But, I mean... How could I possibly ever connect with this guy other than he just showed up one day on a phone list, you know? So it's just weird how that happens sometimes. Um, and then the worst one I would just say is um, just in general, it, you know, it's a really, uh, it can be a really, like I said, soul crushing process sometimes, not for anyone's fault or reason, but it's just, it's really difficult to put yourself out there and, um, apply for a job after job after job after job. And it's challenging, but you have to keep at it. And what I've sort of learned being on the other side of things is now I'm responsible for hiring people, is that you know, they're, you're looking for a ve very specific type of candidate sometimes. And sometimes it's not because you're not a very talented person or you're amazing and you would do a great job. But sometimes, for many different reasons, you're looking for a very specific type of a person to come in and do a very specific job. And so um, we're trying to find them, and so you have to keep putting yourself out there, otherwise we won't find you and someone wouldn't get hired. So it's sort of a numbers game to some degree, but it's, it's really difficult, um, but you just have to do it. It's like buying a car, no one wants to do it, <laughs> but if you need a car, you have to go buy a car. <laughs> Great, so let's start at the beginning of the process and, and maybe with some like, quick tips on resumes and cover letters, which you can also share. Do you actually read cover letters? Because I've <laughs> already got a head shake of a no. Um, but just to, to kick it up too, I would say, so when, you know, Fine Spark is a small team at this point, so I, that's my main thing I look at as a cover letter. And also a really quick resume tip is to include some sort of link at the top. So hopefully it's a, you know, yourname.com, which you built through Wix, but if not, it can be, say, your LinkedIn profile, and if it's relevant, some sort of social media pro profile, but have something that's clickable that you know they can easily learn more about you. I don't. I don't really <laughs> generally read a cover letter, but I don't request one. So I think if if most of the time um, it's requested, you should provide it. Mm -hmm. But I I also think that in the creative um, field, it's generally not requested or read. Um, usually, we're looking for a URL um, and um, some maybe side. Uh, that you're doing um, to sort of provide what your passion is. Um, I tend to find that if you are generally in the social and the creative space, you know, one of the things that we're looking for is if you're a solid writer. So that's going to be highlighted in your resume. So you have to make sure that you're really proofreading this like 16 times. Or have your friend or your mother or your boyfriend or your partner, whoever, read this over a million times. Because I, I even know for myself too, I'm dyslexic, so I will read something and in my head it's like, sounds exactly perfect, but then like I'll be like, someone read this and I like skipped 15 words and I'm like, wait a minute, you know. So I'm like, I've become really an expert at proofreading things because even in emails, sometimes I'm like, what the heck? This. I'm like, oh, I wrote this. <laughs> this is not right. I so I make sure that I, I rewrite things and reread things often. But I'll get resumes that I'm like, what? Did, what do they actually do? Like, what is this actual story? So whatever, for at least in the creative space, like I want to know what your story is. And the rule of having like a one-page resume, if you're someone who has. 10 years experience, you're not gonna have a one page resume. I don't want a 15 page resume either, but I mean, you know, it's okay if you have a two page resume because what did you, like you, you have to explain what your story is, but you know, so if you only have like one sentence that explains that you were a, you know, uh, a copywriter at an agency, what brands were you on? And what were you, you know, what were the campaigns that you worked on those brands? And I mean, you should have a URL or some sort of samples that are, work in conjunction with that, but there should be some sort of uh, continuity to it, and it's okay if it exceeds one page. So, but you should also make sure that there is no spelling errors, especially if you're a copywriter, um, and some sort of portfolio along with that if you're creative. Um, some of the other roles, like if you're, I don't know if I should get into it, but 
So I sort of instituted a different process within the agency I work in now. There was no process whatsoever, nor did they have someone who was an actual leader in the, the talent space. So I um, created a process that I had started a couple of years ago that we didn't implement at RGA, and I brought over the sort of philosophy and the strategy um, that at a certain level, you have to not only be able to interview, but you also should be able to provide samples at a different level. So if you are a director in client services or account management or production or project management, um, you should also, or strategy or something, you should also be able to do a presentation or um, a creative exercise in the situation here. So like you show up and we give you a couple of different things to choose from and present in front of a, a, a bunch of your peers. and. So there's some different things like that that we would have in, you know, once you get through the door through, with your resume. So, um, or writing samples for junior level people, especially with social content, um, that becomes really important because a lot of what we have for social publishers, which are essentially our title for community management, is that you are the voice of the brands that we represent. So we want you to make sure that there aren't spelling errors because they will find those spelling errors and yell at us. <laughs> so we don't want those things. So. Again, that goes back to making sure that um, writing is a huge portion of what we look for in advertising. Um, so the, those are the key things. But again, I don't look at the cover letters. I mean, maybe I should. <laughs> that should be the writing sample I'm looking at. But that's um, really not as important for many. Great. And, and really good uh, exercise that she brought up that I would recommend you all do during the opportunity mixer is to trade resumes with other attendees. Look at it for five seconds and tell them what you think they do. And it's mm. a very interesting exercise to see, you know, you might, you know what you want to do, but how do other people view yeah. how you present yourself? Yeah. yeah, you know, I typically don't read the cover letters. Um, uh, you know, every now and then a hiring manager, if it's in PR or corporate communications, they may say, did, you know, the candidate submit a cover letter? Can we see it? We really want to see their writing style. And then, uh, to your point, we'll ask for additional writing samples. Um, you know, when you're talking about post-production work and someone who's editing, you know, the, the new trailer for Game of Thrones, a portfolio, a reel is essential. Um, and so the cover letter doesn't really um, hold as much weight because um, we want to see, you know, what it is that you can do um, skills-wise on that reel. Um, is your level of skill at the level of what we're looking for? Um, so that's where, where it comes in. If you're doing design, we want to see a portfolio. So um, yeah, the cover letter holds less weight these days. I think um, what I used to look at the cover letter for, again, was your writing, um, your grammar, and then you know sometimes if people are willing to relocate, um, that's huge. But nowadays I see that on the resume, so um, that's really helpful and that doesn't really, um, you don't really need the cover letter. I would say though, sometimes I get a cover letter and then a message in an email, and I think that, um, you know, you want to pay attention to the, the message that you're writing in the email, because I may not click on that attachment, but the body of the email is is what grabs me, it, what's, it's what gets my attention, and I'm I can easily kind of sift through uh, what it is that you want or what role it is that you're interested in versus reading the cover letter, so. Um, I don't think I've seen a cover letter in the last like three or four years. Mm -hmm. I think I normally just get the resume. So when I get a resume, I just assume that everything I need should be on there. I'm, I'm immediately looking for a link at the very top of the resume to go check out their work. I mean, obviously working in video, and creative, um, it's just assume that you should have a website that I can just go to and also like click around and look through all of the stuff that you've done. So be conscious of what else is up on your yeah. Vimeo, um, you know, your Vimeo link or your YouTube or wherever you're hosting it. Uh, also, you know, clarifying what you did on a project. Um, Sometimes we'll, you know, if we're hiring for a specific position, we'll get people from like the same channel sometimes, and it's uh, like five different people all sending the same spot. So I'm like, did this person, well, clearly one person probably wrote it, or one person probably produced it or edited it or whatever. And it's difficult to know how impressed I, I can be about this particular piece of creative if I, if I don't know what your contribution was. So the easier that you can make it for the person who's going to see your resume or reel in terms of organizing it clearly, putting your stuff up on your website and having it 
uh, very clearly organized so that I know all of your writing stuff or all of your your producing stuff or all of your editing stuff is together. It just makes it easier for me to get excited about you because I can understand and take a snapshot of what your talent is um, rather than clicking through and just being confused. Okay. So, internet, we've talked to, uh, at other Fine Spark events about like applicant tracking systems yes. a little bit. So maybe if you can just share like a little insight into, have you guys all heard of an applicant tracking system? No. If you have it, <laughs> an ATS, uh, ATS, it's, it is what it fancy. sounds like. It's how, especially bigger companies track. Um, but you know, we've had people ask questions like, you know, what if there's multiple jobs that I'm interested in at yeah. HBO? Should I apply for all of them? Should I apply for one? Um, maybe you can just share like a little bit of insight into how that, you know, like John joked about in his keynote, actually having to copy and paste all your information into it. But but yeah. just technical things that they should consider when applying through those bigger systems. Yeah, I would say, you know, the ATS, and when it came into HBO, it's kind of like our Bible as far as keeping track of candidates, keeping track of candidate information. Obviously, you know, if you send me an email and I end up, you know, uh, having you go through the process, then there's a little bit of a kind of back end thing that we work out um, if you haven't applied or if I met you at an event and I get your resume that way. Um, but it really uh, helps us keep track of the applicants. And I, um, you know, when I was recruiting on the experienced hire side, it really was kind of my go-to, right? So, you know, maybe I didn't get to go to as many events that quarter or maybe I didn't, um, you know, I'm not going to LinkedIn first. That would be that first place that I would check for um, an applicant's uh, information. I would say, you know, if you're applying through that system, we, uh, good recruiters, and, and we're held to, uh, we actually have, you know, responsibilities as recruiters too, we're working, um, and so we have to use the applicant tracking system. So I know people say it's a black hole and all of that. I know it's a little odd because you send it through and then you don't get a call back or um, whatever, but um, it really, we do use it and we do rely on it at HBO. Um, you know, I would say definitely upload your resume into that system because a lot of times I will, and I won't get into how it's all organized, but it's, there's a dashboard and all of that. And, and sometimes I'm like, yes, I'm going to click on this candidate and this is going to be the one. And then there's no resume. There's like that generated um, kind of um, form. And I'm like, oh God. And so now do I, that just gives that takes up more time in the process, right? So now do I have to call you to get the resume? Do I even have time for that today to like do that? Um, and then that's a missed opportunity for the candidate. So I would say as much as possible, just make sure that you're just following the steps and putting your information through. Um, but we do, we use keywords. I mean, there there's so many applicants that we get. So again, um, to your point, you know, it, it, it is a, a challenging task. Uh, for the candidates to kind of put yourself out there. But I think it's equally challenging for the recruiter to, to really try to give everyone an opportunity um, and kind of go through that process. You know, I think a good recruiter really, um, their goal is to help people, right? And so I would love to help everybody, but you know, sometimes it just doesn't uh, go that way. So um, as far as multiple jobs, I can see if candidates apply to 100 jobs at a, at a time, and I can see what jobs they're applying to. Um, and sometimes I give the candidate the benefit of the doubt, right? So sometimes our you know titles are very ambiguous in a sense. The job descriptions maybe aren't as clear as you know you would think they are. Um, and you just kind of put yourself in the candidate's shoes to say, okay, are they understanding this? Um, you know, there's digital in three different titles. Okay, they've applied to the, all three. They probably think that it's all the same thing, mm -hmm. and maybe it's not. So I would just say be mindful of that um, because I see a lot of times, you know, especially entry level candidates, they'll apply to finance and then they'll apply to PR and then they'll apply to marketing. And I'm just like, wait, <laughs> what do you want? You know, and then I look at your major and it's psychology. So that's even more confusing to me because I'm like, I don't know what it is that you want. Um, so, you know, really being mindful of that. I think the job description is there to help you. And um, it's a guideline, it's a baseline for what the position entails, how many years of experience is required, and we, we go by that. Um, so if it says 10 years of experience, and you don't have 10 years of experience, don't even do it to yourself to apply, you know? It just, to me, it just doesn't make sense, uh, because I'm looking for a high level 
uh, person. I get a lot of recent graduates that apply to manager roles. And again, it is kind of confusing because I think at agencies, manager may mean different than what it means in you know, a larger organization. Um, so you know, as much as you can, um, just really try to pay attention to those things um, when you're applying through the ATS. But we look at, we look at. <laughs> um, Kristen, you mentioned it super briefly, side hustles. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could share a little bit about uh, how people can best position non-traditional experiences. So things like side projects, they have their own Etsy shop, they started a meetup, um, they just did a commercial or something for fun. Uh, they're a volunteer, you know, how do you, how, what are some good ways to position those experiences as experiences that might not be like I was getting paid full time to do this or, you know, on a resume or within the process? It, well, for me, it's like one of the questions I ask anyway, so it might not be something that somebody puts on their resume mm -hmm. because I think it's important um, just even personally as a creative person that like you have something that fills your passion. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the way that we function function as a as a society these days, like people work a lot of hours and might not be doing what they want in life, mm -hmm. you know. So if you are someone who's like naturally creative and took a job in finance because you have to pay your student loans, like, and you're sort of drowning in the fact that you're like in numbers all day, like hopefully you're doing something that really actually sort of like makes you feel happy outside mm -hmm. of work. So. For me, like I sort of believe in like finding your joy in other places, so I always ask those questions. Um, like, so, like, do you have a blog? And I think it's also really important for people who are junior level um, to have, um, like, maybe they can't. There isn't the market's not that great, and they can't figure out how to get into, you know, the social content space. You know, they want to find a community management role, but they right now are stuck. You know, working at a coffee bar, they're working whatever. They're trying to just pay their bills but like you should have a blog maybe like this is you know find some followers on that for your blog you know we recently had a um, like we call them social publishers um, opportunity and he was a gentleman who worked uh, uh, with I guess the developmentally disabled and he reached out he's a little bit older he wasn't like your standard early 20s gentleman and he had I think 1200 followers on Twitter you know, just like knowing that, like he got the space, but he wasn't necessarily formally trained to do that type of work, but it was like, he's doing something right here, you know, and, and he, he had some side stuff that he was doing, like, but, you know, and here he's doing a great job, and it's like, but here, let's give you foundational information now that you're here, and we'll help you figure out how to keep moving this, you know, but just sort of like highlighting, hey, I have this many Twitter followers here, this is what I do with music, you know, he might not necessarily have those skills. Mm -hmm. Like I, I've been helping with, with you know, non for profit here for a long time. Like there, I think a experienced recruiter is going to pick up on different things and understand those things. Mm -hmm. um, same goes with someone. Uh, URLs mentioning that too. I think it's super important that it's great that Behance is out there. It's great that Coreflot's out there. Crop. There's all these different portfolio um, sites that allow you to create your portfolio in here. But at this point, if you're going to school to be a designer, you should be able to just whip out a URL for yourself and be like, kristenrock.com or krock.com, whatever it is, and create your, that's part of, that should be part of your curriculum and um, in school, or that's something you should be sort of uh, discovering and figuring out. And that's your opportunity to highlight what you do, and what you've done, and here's your portfolio. And it's very easy at that point, too, to sort of list this was my, I created, I concepted, I did this whole thing. It could be a side project, could have been like, you know, a pizza place down the street in your local village, whatever it is, you know, like, but this is what I did. Take on volunteer opportunities. You might not get paid, you might get free pizza, you might get whatever, you know, but like, do what you can. And one of the things I said was like, invest in yourself. Mm -hmm. So like, that could be like a really strange way to like, well, what does that mean, what does that mean? You have the ability to do a lot of things for yourself that you're not getting necessarily from a employer, you know. But as, a, as someone, if you have an interest in something, there's a lot of opportunity to figure those things out without necessarily spending money. Just research, research, research. There's things all over the place that you could do for free for yourself. You research the company, you research, you know, uh, the 
the direction you want to go in, be five steps ahead for yourself, knowing where to go. Um, I, I can, mean, I can't stress that more, you know, especially from a recruiter's perspective. Like, if you come in and you don't know anything about a company, you don't know anything about the opportunity, you don't know anything about what's the next step after that position, you're not really that interested then in investing yourself in, in that direction in your career. So, so let's do a, a quick rapid fire answer. What, for, for, we'll go down the line, start with you, John. What is one of the first things you notice when someone walks in for an interview? I am looking at how they're dressed. Okay. I am. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if I'm like old school about this, but I am floored sometimes mm -hmm. at when people come in for interviews and they're just not dressed for an interview. Um, I don't wear a tux to work or anything like that, but yeah. it really is important that it's the it's the signal to the world, not so much of like what you're wearing, but that you're wearing something that's appropriate for an interview because it signals to me that like you get it and that when you walk in a room, you know your audience, which is a guy who's looking to hire someone and so you're dressing accordingly. So that means to me that like you get it, this person's professional. Mm -hmm. um, AMC Networks does a great co-op program um, where we, it, it's almost like a paid internship program, and they spend a lot of time teaching their uh, students how to dress, how to conduct an interview, mm -hmm. and sometimes the, the co-op students that come in just for paid internships completely eclipse people who are entry level in terms of how they conduct themselves, how they're dressed. Mm -hmm. um, just because you're in a creative field doesn't mean you have to be stuffy, it doesn't mean that you have to dress in formal wear to, a, to an interview, but you should be dressed like you are going to impress someone. When I started at IFC, I started, I started very dressed up, and then I progressively got into <laughs> jeans, and sometimes I wear Converse, and sometimes I wear blazers, and sometimes I don't. It depends on the day and if I have meetings or whatever, but you know, first, wear a suit. Be dressed up, look great, and conduct yourself really professionally, and then later on, you can be creative through your clothing and you know whatever else. But at least I think it's a good opportunity to sort of set the stage from the first meeting. Great. I agree. It's the look. Um, and then you know, whenever I, um, before I even meet the candidate, the receptionist brings the resume to my office, um, and she'll give me tidbits of who that person is, how they approached her. Um, and when I used to read this in the articles, I didn't think it was true that like, oh, be nice to the security person mm -hmm. and the receptionist because they'll tell the recruiter. It's so true. <laughs> it's so true. She will tell me, we'll have, I'll be like, what? That rude to you? Oh my gosh. And then that already kind of impacts my perception of you. Um, but to the dressing, you know, HBO is a little uh, interesting because we have these different pockets of subcultures within the overall culture. So, you know, finance, you may see people in three-piece suits, or if you're looking at anyone who's um, a VP or above, they're probably a little bit more dressed up, but it's not the dressed up in a three-piece suit kind of way, you know? Even our CEO, he doesn't wear ties. It's very, like, modern, contemporary kind of look, um, but it's very pulled together. And I think as, as long as you're well-groomed and pulled together and you're not wearing anything that's distracting, um, you know, that's, that's what really speaks to me. So, um, you know, sometimes if candidates come to the interview in, in, in a suit and they're going to the creative department, creative de department is a little, you know, taken aback. They're like, wait, I don't think this person, like, wants to be here because <laughs> we wear jeans every day. But they're not, I don't want you to wear jeans to the interview either. You know, it could be a little bit more casual. But if it's more on the corporate side, if it's, you know, a, a role um, in business development or global distribution, you definitely want to be a little bit more uh, corporate because they're thinking about how are you going to dress when you're interacting with clients, how are you going to dress um, when you're out kind of representing HBO. So um, definitely the dress and, and how someone um, treats the receptionist is, is really important. Yeah. And I absolutely agree with both. I yeah. think it's a, a totally important. I also think, um, are you on time? Yeah. Um, and if you're not going to be on time, definitely just let someone know. Don't say, well, I was rushing here and I'm sorry, I'm 15 minutes late. I'd rather you stop, call, send an email, and let me know that you're going to be late because you're on the train or you're mm -hmm. in a cab or whatever it is because that's, mm -hmm. I, you know, one of the things I, we're, I'm in a smaller company and I have to manage my time to deliver you to maybe an executive or a hiring manager who's 
on a very tight leash with their schedule and it pushes like it becomes a domino effect mm -hmm. if I'm late I might be like have three minutes before I have to get on a phone call and then it becomes like the whole day is screwed up mm -hmm. um, so I want to know that you're gonna be late or I have to get someone else to help like maneuver through things so um, and not that it's always, like, I don't look at it as necessarily completely inconsiderate, but it is a little inconsiderate. <laughs> um, but I also just sort of, it, it says to me that you maybe you were a little unprepared as yeah. well. So, And I would say, too, you know, um, when on the note of, of time, you know, when um, my uh, recruiting assistant is scheduling, you know, the interview, I kind of tell her, ask the candidate what their availability is like. So if you're not a morning person, don't say that you can be at the office at 9 a.m. for a 9 a.m. interview. Because, and especially, you know, think about where you're commuting from. Think about all of those things so you can build in enough time because I've had candidates who I think get just afraid to even show up because they're late, then they don't show up. And that is the worst. <laughs> Thing you could ever ever do um, and yes call email or something um, that's better than just not showing up at all so really think about that um, you know if it's afternoon and you're running from one place to the other or if you're you already have a job and you want to interview in the middle of the day just take the day like take the day or try to leave early um, really think about those things when you're um, preparing for an interview all right, so I want to do two more quick, like, one-line answer questions because I want to save time for them. Um, so first quick one-line answer. Okay. What would be a reason someone might not get a job that doesn't have to do with them being qualified for the job? So beyond them, you know, it's not that they weren't good enough. It's not that they didn't have, you know, say, meet that job description. What is a behind-the-scenes reason that they might not have gotten the job? Quick, quick one-line answer. Um... Oh my God! So, or does somebody so else have one already? Yeah, I know. Poor attitude. To be honest. Okay. <laughs> and you can maybe expand on that a little bit when you say poor attitude. You know, some people um, come in with a lot of arrogance. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, aggressive follow-up. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, um, just being so aggressive <laughs> via email mm -hmm. um, can be a little bit of a turnoff. And what might you define as aggressive? Like maybe if you have a specific example of someone, maybe outlining like how many? Yeah, you know? I mean, it could be a mix of things, you know, like capital letters mm -hmm. in an oh. email of like, I interviewed two weeks ago and you, oh <laughs> like God. that kind of thing, or, or even just that messaging, right? Yeah. So it's almost like I've had candidates reprimand me in a way where I'm just like, no, that doesn't work, <laughs> actually. Um, and again, just kind of putting your, yourself in the, in the mindset of the recruiter and just kind of the, the bigger picture, it, the follow-up, just the aggressive follow-up can really okay. be a turnoff. Great. I'd say maybe budget. Sometimes we have really great candidates. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you're on the website and you have to enter, like, what is your salary that you like to make? Well, I'd like to make $500,000, <laughs> but I don't know that they're going to pay me for that. So you have to walk that fine line of, Let's just say there was a position that was like 50 grand was our budget for the position, and you put in, I'd like to make 60, we probably would still keep you in, in our running of, of candidates. But if you're looking for 100 grand, yeah. we just probably can't afford you because you're looking for double. So do your research first and be realistic about maybe like what the salary is and based on how many years experience you can, add. I mean, I still do it to this day whenever we're hiring for someone, it's like, What's sort of the ballpark of what this position should be paid based on, you know, we're looking for someone with three years versus ten years. Ago. Right. All right, so final question for me um, and, uh, would be, and, and Trinity talked a little bit about it, but yeah. follow-up. Because yeah. it's a big thing people ask us at FindSpark all the time, even, you know, say after an event like this, how do I follow up with people? Um, so maybe just giving, you know, a quick like a quick do and a quick don't, and like you already gave the don't, yep. but, um, uh, and, and also in the sense of following up, after you've interviewed for a job, but then also staying in touch if you didn't get the job. Like you found mm -hmm. out you didn't get it or you assume you didn't get it because you know you went for two months you didn't hear. Uh, what are ways that people can stay connected to the recruiters or the hiring managers who they interviewed with if that one wasn't a particularly good fit? Well, the thing to understand is that the re a recruiter is not a decision maker. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they could put their like uh, two cents in that they really like they're someone, they think they're, yeah, they're, they think they're appropriate, you know, they, they have the skills and you do the initial screen generally mm -hmm. to talk about um, the appropriateness of, of their background or whatever and they fit in the, 
budget wise or whatever, but they're not a decision maker mm -hmm. and they're generally relying on finance to make the approval, the hiring manager, all these different pieces. So they're the middle person. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of times we do get badgered and it's, uh, you know, and you're trying to sort of uh, manage expectations on a, for a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. So it's the, it, the internal expectations, the, the candidate expectations, financial, the team, the client sometimes, yes. you know, so you're managing a lot of balls and for multiple, multiple people, yes. for multiple roles. Yes. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, organizational things that you're doing at any given time. Um, so sometimes you might not hear for two or three weeks and it's not, nobody should be taking anything personally. And that's mm -hmm. where this, mm -hmm. the follow up piece and people sort of becoming jerks about it then you sort of get pushed further down in the list. Yeah. <laughs> because you're like, okay, wait a minute. Like, I'm not taking this personally and you should not be taking this personally and unfortunately, for happenstance reasons, this is not happening. And I'm gonna try to keep, you know, as professional about this as possible, but you're gonna need to just hold the phone because yeah. this is not in my control. And I always try to follow up with people and make sure that they understand, please be patient. It's out of my control. And sometimes it happens very quickly and you're mm -hmm. like, oh, hallelujah, this is working. <laughs> yeah. you know, this is the, the system actually works. Here. This is great. Um, dues, I think it's great. You should always send a thank you note within 48 hours of meeting every hiring manager you meet. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't really know what to say, it could be just thank you very, very much for meeting me, professional, cite something that you talked about that really enticed you, whatever. You should always make sure you do that. You could follow up with the recruiter if you didn't have the email for the hiring manager, mm -hmm. and that's great. And then I would wait a week. After one week, mm -hmm. hey, I just wanted to check in. Hopefully the recruiter gets back to you. Sometimes they do. Sometimes I, I try to always make sure that I do that. Mm -hmm. um, then send another two weeks, but don't, I mean, if you're not hearing anything after a month, sometimes things slip through the cracks. Mm -hmm. But I would say, um, I try to stay in touch with people all the time. For pe I, there are people that did not fit the bill. Eight months later, I placed them someplace else within the organization. Do not take anything personally. It might be the wrong opportunity at the wrong time. There are a lot of opportunities that might be the right fit down the road. And sometimes those recruiters go to other companies that have other opportunities. You do not want to piss off the gatekeeper. Very very you do not. Want, it's a very small industry, and very seriously, fun. you do not want to. They remember you. <laughs> I when I went in house. Sorry, I'm taking longer. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure I save time for you. Everything for us. I went to I went to RGA, and I they put me into a, a digital production role, and I brought someone in. I had no idea, and they and I showed up at the coffee bar with her, and they're like, send her home, and I was like, why? They're like, she's not. She's not a. She's not good, and I was. They're, they're like, did you, did you look? We worked. I worked with her at this other agency, and she, we got rid of a client because of her. And I was like, I don't know. I just started here. I had no idea. Yeah. People do not remember people, so Great. just something to remember. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree with everything you just said. Um, thank you notes. Um, you know, sometimes I get asked, should it be a handwritten note? Should it be via email? You know, I think if you're in doubt send both, you know, if you're like torn about it and it's like bothering you, send both. Email is fine for me. What I find sometimes is that people, and, and to your point, that was a great, great point about gatekeeper and, and you know, recruiters are influencers and things like that. Um, a lot of times candidates will send me thank you notes, but they won't send the hiring manager a thank you note. And that is a big problem because the hiring manager will remember it. So they're not, me, I, you may not send me a thank you note, I probably won't even remember. <laughs> because I've got so much going on and so many balls in the air. But the hiring manager, they don't interview for a living. So they are working on a certain role. They've talked to six people. They will know if two of those six did not send a thank you note. It will stand out. Um, and a lot of times I get calls and like, did you get a thank you note? I didn't get a thank you note. Did I don't see a thank you note. Let me call John and see if he got a thank you note. And they do that because it's just about how are you following up. And the thank you note, you know, people are like, thank you note, thank you note. It's, it's... Uh, 
think about it in a, a in a bigger sense you know what are your follow-up skills in general you know especially if you're in a client facing role what are your follow-up skills like um do you really want the job in a sense you know are you putting forth that extra effort and a lot of times in the work world it is about putting forth that extra effort so the thank you note symbolizes a lot of different things um, and because it's a standard because everyone it's a thing um, for you not to send a thank you note is is bad <laughs> you know if it wasn't a thing if there were like two companies on the planet that said we love thank you notes um, then okay if you don't send a thank you note that's fine but if it's standard it's just like a standard practice um, that's been going on for many many years now um, which I think it's just packaged differently via you know your option for a thank you, uh, an email or mm -hmm. an actual card um, just send the thank you note great yeah. and you got to do a keynote so quick answer same thing I think, <laughs> I, think you know, I think an email's fine I think a smarter thing to do is to send a handwritten note you don't have to do it. It's smarter to do that. I think you should send it to everyone that you meet. Yeah. So if you meet five people in one interview, you should send them to all five of those people. Mm -hmm. And um, it should be, you know, something that's like professional and mm -hmm. and basic, not like a s sunflower with sunglasses on being like, yes. hey, dude, thanks so much. <laughs> um, it should be something professional. Great. All right.